Thank you for joining us. You're watching Notepad. I'm your host Ibrahim Sani. Um, today we shall speak a little bit about my uh, about my alma mater, uh, the International Islamic University uh, of Malaysia (IIUM) or UIA, um, pretty much known across the country as such. Um, here we are trying to discuss how it takes uh, a lot of effort over a long time to build talents across the board through auditory excellence. And what does that mean? That means talking about debating, public speaking, talks about mooting. And of course, I've asked or I have solicited some of your views about what you want to ask the rector of UIA uh, this evening. And there are some questions that I can go through very shortly. Um, of course, uh, IIUM uh, is celebrating their 30 uh, or has celebrated their 35th uh, anniversary. Uh, they've come up with some uh, interesting literature, if I can just focus in uh, on this one. So this talks about some of the key highlights of what has happened throughout the university. And of course, the author of this book is joining us uh, for this evening's discussion, Leading the Way. Uh, may I invite, or I'd like to ha ha be happy to introduce uh, Professor Meritus Tansri, uh, Datuk Zulkifli, Abdul Razak, Tansri Zul. Again, thanks very much for taking the time uh, to speak with us. Let's talk a little bit about the ongoings of uh, IIUM. Mm -hmm. How has the uh, university uh, been under your, uh, I guess, uh, tutelage uh, over the past few years? Um, what, is, what will be the expectations moving forward, at least for this year? Well, uh, since I came on board 18 months ago, we've been looking at the university as an international Islamic university. I think that two words there has its own significance and its own meaning. How international, how Islamic, I think this is the question that we are grappling with. Mm. In the last eight months, we have been defining that to a certain extent. International means uh, the university must be involved in international agenda, global agenda. And one of the things that we brought in, in in quite a big way is the whole idea of sustainable development, goal, climate change. And how does that then uh, fit in into this whole idea of Islam? How does Islam view sustainable development, climate change and stuff like that? Which are basically part and parcel of our daily uh, kind of commitment to it. So the last one, 18 months, we have a kind of shift uh, our orientation a little bit in the sense that the university must be engaged with the community around us. And we have crafted among ourselves 29 flagship programs, uh, beginning from cleaning up the water until working with the community, the Aborigines community and so on and so forth. Mm. Uh, so that has been the preoccupation for the last 18 months. And just yesterday we have been wrapping up with what are the achievements that we've made. And Alhamdulillah, I think we've made quite a good break in the context of uh, getting the university to be recognised internationally on those grounds, not just on Islamic grounds, and also contributing into the definitions of sustainable development. Uh, for example, we bring in the context of Makasi Asharia. How does that gel in? How this Rahmatan uh, uh, mean mercy for all, you know, uh, gelled in into sustainable development. So that has been the intellectual quote unquote plus practical uh, application as far as I am concerned. And we hope that will be uh, the, the, the trigger to move forward. I mean, it sounds very exciting. In fact, uh, <coughs> from the uh, United Nations uh, Sustainable Development Goals conversation that uh, was currently was, that was held uh, late last year, mm. um, the minister in the Prime Minister's Department in charge of religious affairs, mm. uh, Mujahid Rawa, argues that Ramadan Lil Alamin mm. is very much in tandem with uh, UN Sustainable Goals. Yes. Um, and therefore, it's easy to, I guess, map the 27 UN SDG yes. um, agendas or goals uh, with that of Makasi Sharia. Yeah. The problem here is, of course, when you think about lofty ideals and lofty goals, yeah. it's all about execution. How yeah. well or how ill-equipped for that matter do you think that uh, the communities within Malaysia mm. and uh, of the, uh, the members within uh, IIUM mm. uh, is uh, equipped or well uh, uh, facilitated to have the necessary tools to execute these kind of lofty goals? I think it is not impossible in the sense that uh, if you talk about Islamic perspective, Islamic worldview that has been there for a long time. Uh, for example, when you talk about um, Rahmatan Lil Alamin, I mean, the university has been singing this song for the last 30 years, for mm. heaven's sake, you know. Mm. Mm. Rahmatan Lil Alamin was just introduced by the new government maybe a couple of months ago. Mm. So he has been part and parcel of the university in many ways. As a question of now, how do you orient it to make it good? So, for example, when you talk about Rahmatan Lil Alamin, how much are we reaching to the local public, for example? You know, how much of knowledge transfer has been given to Kampung Sungai Pusu or the Orang Asli, what are the things that they need? And we begin to learn from them some of the notions of sustainable development in the Orang Asli uh, punya community are still very much pristine. 
Yes, of course. And we need to take that back, become mainstream as far as sustainable development. It's not a dominant thing from quote unquote modernity and indigenous uh, role do not have any role in this. Yeah. So that's Just to give context, uh, the main campus <coughs> of IIUM is uh, located in Gomba. Exactly. It is within Sungai Pusu locality and exactly. there's a lot of um, orang asli community there. Exactly. All right. Uh, yeah. uh, 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 what, I, what attracted my point just now was to be recognized globally is also part of the agenda of the university. Yeah. Uh, but I find time and again that IIUM is absent um, from the QS ranking. I also take note that you've, wrote, uh, uh, you've written a, a rather long piece about uh, QS ranking, but that question keeps on cop cropping up. Mm. Why isn't UIA part of, uh, of that conversation of QS ranking? Well, uh, a, a university is not a one-size-fits-all. In other words, there are many models of university, and certainly an Islamic university take a different stance altogether. For example, when we talk about IUM, uh, the, 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 the four things that we always talk about, the Amana, for example, which is very key. And no university that I've been talk about Amana in the, the passionate way that we talked about. Rahmatanil Alamin, about humanity. Most universities just talk about their own locality and where they are. So if we start to shift into another criteria that is defined by somebody else for us, then we may lose some of the very essence of what IUM is all about. Mm. So rather than saying that let's go into let's go and change our our vision or our focus because we want to fit into somebody else's ranking, we might as well devise another one. And indeed, this is what we are trying to do now, mm. to define what an Islamic university, in fact, what is a modern university in 21st century looks like. What QS is doing, from my point of view, is defining a university at a level of the 20th century, the industrial age kind of a university. A university is seen like a factory, and you begin to count numbers, uh, KPIs, and this and that, whereas we want to open that up a little bit and take up, talk about the intangibles at the same time. So when I talk about community engagement, uh, how do you define that? You know, it's just because you cannot measure it and you don't engage in university. So these are the very taxing questions that we are looking at and putting IIUM in a different pedestal altogether rather than joining the bandwagon of QS, which to me is a commercial drive anyway. Uh, but uh, while I understand that this would be some of the key <coughs> features you want to stand apart from the others, um, do you think that there would be a set of challenges on its own right when you want to say that you want to be internationally rec recognized, uh, but it's not using the same parameters as the rest of the world is using. Do you think that there would be some challenges in that? I, I think, I think there's, there's, there's a misperception that most of the world that I know of when I'm engaged them, they don't look at ranking for QS particularly as something which is quote-unquote uh, lofty. Yeah. You know, there are other rankings that are more quote-unquote objective in mm, this particular mm, sense mm, mm. that they will prefer that as compared to US. And QS is much more acceptable in this part of the region because we are less critical mm. about QS. Mm. You know, at one time, if you remember, QS and Times were together and then they split. Why do they split? They split because of the criteria they don't agree with. And some of us still do not agree. For example, 40% of QS uh, 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 evaluation is on perception. You know, and perception is very, very... I guess intangible. Soft, yeah. you know, uh, and we don't think that's objective enough to get into a, particularly in a third world country when people do not know you. And when they ask for perception, they say, well, we don't know, know. Sometimes they don't even know where the country is. So those are issues that I think we are uh, not comfortable with. If you want to go for ranking, we'll go something which is more objective and in more robust in that particular sense. All right. Um, I continue con my conversation with uh, the director of IIUM, uh, Tan Si Jul, after this. Um, I am with uh, Professor Emeritus Tansri Dato Zulki Filip Razak, the Rector of the International Islamic University of Malaysia. Uh, we are on the conversation of how this university is rising head and shoulders above others in trying to build, um, I guess, uh, profitable, uh, functioning, um, uh, and most importantly, effective uh, community leaders in and around the country. Uh, so, Tan Sri Zul, we left off uh, before the break talking about uh, the QS ranking, but of course, the general theme of our conversation is also about uh, recognition of what you guys do, which is, again, um, a, a little bit different from how other universities um, and other institutions of higher learning is doing. Mm. There was a little anecdote that you wanted to share with us. Let's, uh, let's hear this uh, story out. 
Well, uh, when, when we talk about uh, uh, ranking per se, we want to uh, exhibit or at least uh, tell the world what we are good at. You know, uh, just because we have four criteria that you, know, you missed out what we are good at doesn't mean we are not good. Yeah. So in the in this context of debate, oratory, the excellence that you talked about, mm. there is something that we have excelled uh, over the last 30 years. I think that has been developed over time, and now I think it's, all, it's almost synonymous when you talk about debate, dissenting, public speaking. Uh, I, I am is always there. Yeah. And I don't think until now there's any local university, even regional university at, that, at, that, at this point uh, can match what we have performed uh, over the last 30 years. And I think that is a kind of a hallmark that is not easy to get uh, given QS ranking or otherwise. Okay, let's talk a little bit about this. is a nice segue, uh, Tan Sri, in terms of the conversation of my initial idea of bringing you in. Because we didn't want to talk about um, you know, uh, QS ranking per se. We wanted to talk about how UIA or IIUM is building its core strength in terms of IIUM yeah. debating yeah. Uh, and oratory excellence. Yeah. I'm a product of that. I have to admit, um, and I'm proud to admit that, um, uh, we have the uh, world's youngest minister. At that point in time, of course, now we, the world has seen even younger prime ministers. <laughs> exactly. uh, but uh, the, the idea here is that when you talk about debating and when you talk about public speaking and oratory excellence and mooting for that matter uh, yeah. for the law uh, undergrads, you're talking about not just the prowess of speaking out in public, yeah. uh, it's also being able to critically think. It's about trying to understand better how you prepare as a debater, as a public speaker, mm -hmm speaker and most importantly very very importantly in fact trying to listen more than you talk because how else can you argue accordingly and argue not to win mm -hmm. but argue to get the best point forward if you don't listen much of the conversation that we're having now is that we're actually listening to each other more than we are talking to each other right. this kind of skill is not an overnight thing yeah. for you to build. Yeah. Just like any other skill, you talk about it being honed over years, yes. um, you know, in, from, from high school, from matriculation mm -hmm. or CFS as you call it, um, and of course uh, the four years of undergraduate and many others of our uh, you know, friends and colleagues and fellow students uh, continue to do this even when they are undergraduates uh, studying in IIUM. Mm -hmm. This is a long story um, and UIA is not uh, I guess, uh, letting up into this kind of conversation. In fact, UIA is doubling down its efforts in, and pardon my pun of using a gambling metaphor, but yes, doubling down on its efforts in trying to build a greater uh, prospect of, of, your, uh, of undergraduates uh, and, and postgraduates that is excelling in this. Mm -hmm. Do you think that there is a, a clear definition of how you want to take this even further? Uh, do you think that there would be a time and place for us to actually put down markers and say, you know what, it's as, as much as we can build uh, 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 students um, and excel in this area, mm. there needs to be better engagement with the community, mm. funding yes. is a big problem, mm. I guess, uh, you know, it's a big thing for us to discuss, mm. uh, maybe alumni can chip in, mm. you know, there's another way of doing things. Mm. What would be the next step uh, for debate in IIUM? Yeah, unfortunately, unlike you, I'm not an alumni of IIUM, but I'm proud to be the rector now. Uh, but <laughs> <laughs> you are very much the IIUM family. <laughs> Coming from the outside, I think one of the things that strikes me as far as the debating is concerned, from my point of view, this is what university is all about. It's not just standing on stage speaking. I think university is about this debating as a culture of its own, you know. If it, even though you don't have a debating team, for example, the university must engage in debates. The university must start to question and have dissenting views and agree to disagree. These are all the, the, the thing that is important to make an university a university. Now, if you don't have that, then I think university is almost like a high school or even worse than that, that you just listen and sometimes you listen just to rigidate it. You know, you don't actually think about it. So this whole phenomenon of debate, the way I look at it, it allows students, first of all, to be courageously enough to speak their mind. And I think we don't have that. Half our students just listen and after that, you know, swallow and they moved out. Yeah, passive. Yes, very passive. Uh, secondly, it's about critically thinking, you know, um, I can have a different point of view and it doesn't matter. I don't have to agree with you and I can be comfortable of that. Be, you may be a politician, you may be a minister, a prime minister, I can still disagree with you and we can still remain friends and I think we don't have that also. In Malaysia, if you disagree, suddenly you're my enemy and I need to dump you down for one reason or the other, you know. So that spoils the whole idea of knowledge seeking. So Paul, the whole idea of trying to get, you know, uh, building a leader, as it were, 
you know. So this phenomenon of debates that you see in IIUM is a cultural thing that has expanded from one kulia into now multi kulia and now going beyond Malaysia into other parts of the world, which I think is a is a development that no other university can can match uh, because it is not planned that way. Mm. Uh, and I think you are lucky in the sense that this has been part of the culture and only that I hope it becomes part and parcel of a daily living that we can still have this argument uh, within the university, between lecturers and, and, and students, between rectors and staff and we still remain the same. And that's how the university moved up. Mm -hmm. you know? So this debate to me is, is, is a good platform that everybody later on should be able to, 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 to participate. So we are trying to demystify this whole idea of debating being an event and that everybody, you know, must come to, uh, you know, to, to a stage and applaud and stuff. We want it to make it into something that everybody practices every day. Okay. You can sit in the canteen and you can debate. There's nothing wrong with it. All right. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about the demystification of uh, debate, but that happens right after this break. Don't go anywhere. <laughs> Thanks for staying on with us. You're watching Notepad. I am with the rector of IIUM, Tan Sri Datuk Zulkifli Abdul Razak, talking about uh, the idea of IIUM being the champion of oratory excellence. Speaking of which, there is a competition that is coming up very, very soon. Uh, can I just pull up the particular graphic? This is, of course, the Asian uh, Arabic uh, debating championship happening uh, towards the end of this month, early next month here, in fact, uh, in Gomba, uh, Selangor. Uh, Tansri, if I can just pull back to this particular uh, mm. uh, event, mm -hmm. um, we talk about uh, IIUM being a, a debating institution. Normally, people would assume, okay, fine, it's English, it is Malay. Not normally, people associate it with Arabic. Mm. Would these kind of events be a critical, I guess, showcase highlight to tell the world that you guys are more than just uh, you know English and Malay? Yes, yeah, certainly. I think uh, this is something that I discover in the university with a hundred nations being represented in the university, I mean, we can speak more than a hundred languages. Mm. You know, of course, there are small uh, committees speaking that. But the whole idea that knowledge, diverse, uh, language diversity in the university is not something that uh, we should frown on. You know, it's not just English uh, or Bahasa Malaysia or Arabic. It's all together. How do you mix this? And this is where I think IIUM is, a, is a, an icon for this. We, we are good in English, we are good in Arabic, we are certainly good in Bahasa Malaysia. And whatever else that you need us to do, definitely we can do it. Because the culture of speaking, the culture of debating, the culture of articulating is there. It's a matter of picking up the language and then, you know, delivering it the way it is to be. So it is no, no difficulty the way we look at English now, as though it's so difficult to overcome English. Uh, but people who can speak Arabic cannot speak English. Sometimes it is demystified because it's more difficult yeah. to learn Arabic as compared to English. So it's a perception of the mind, I think, rather than anything else. L let's talk about some of the perceptions or misperceptions that is uh, befuddling the public in terms of the debating community here. Um, <coughs> do you think that it's time for you guys to step out and say, you know what, you, everyone is welcome. Uh, it's not a scary, I, I guess, event. Um, yeah. It's 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 uh, an, an, a, a, you know a thrashing of ideas and uh, a sharing of knowledge. It's nothing of this elitist kind of notion. What kind of the biggest misperceptions that you have to combat in terms of making uh, debating a little bit more pedestrian and a little bit more approachable for the average person? Yeah, I come from a different cohort. I, I, um, when I was a student 40 years ago, it's a question of space. I was a student in the early 70s when the AUKU was in there. It's a question of space. We speak our mind. There's a speaker's corner that everybody takes part, you know. Uh, sometimes it is rebellious, but some more often than not, it's a question of just community, communicating ideas from the youngsters to another youngsters. Yeah. And this is where we pick language. I mean, I, I don't learn language from a book. Uh, I learn language from speaking it as, you know, as, as, as and when I understand it. But after a while, you get into the groove, you've got the courage, you learn the confidence, 
in your English somehow or rather becomes better over a period of time. I always look at it, speaking as like playing football, uh, Brian. You can read as many books as you want on how to be a good footballer. If you go down to the, you don't go down to the field and start kicking the balls, you'll never be a good footballer. Mm. It's something like that. I mean, if you just learn how to be a good English speaker but never speak, and because you there's no space for you to speak, and worst thing because your fear. There's a kind of fear to speak out your mind. And then you, you, you get locked in and you never get to practice but your, the, your But language. the fear is founded, at least during the, the, the era of the University Act being in place. And it was in place for a few decades. Yeah. Um, do you think that because of the removal of the University Act, or AUKU for its uh, short form, this will precipitate the kind of conversations that you've seen 40 years ago? I certainly hope so, but the, 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 the kind of thing that I test with my students here, sometimes I tell them, look now, the AUKU is no longer there. Uh, and maybe, you know, some of the, uh, what do you call, uh, provision that will be removed. Mm. Uh, in fact, position sometimes be removed, uh, but they still don't understand. It's almost like we are caged for the last 40 years. Now I open the door to the cage and you do not know how to fly. You know, we are so used to that cage and the whole world is that cage to fly out. It takes another form of courage. It takes another form of, you know, uh, skills to move out. I think that's the one that we are trying to build now to tell the student it's okay to speak as long as you do it rationally, academically, as long as you're not inciting or making other people uncomfortable, you are, you are okay to do this. You know, yeah. that's the that's level that we are getting into at the moment in time, opening up and giving more space for them to speak out and to make sure that they are quote-unquote protected in that particular sense. Uh, Tan Sri, it seems that if I can just generally, you know, use some general broad themes of your conversation here, is that you're trying to build a culture. You're touching a little bit on the culture of debate, you're now touching a culture of fear, culture of passiveness, and how, you know, this culture has to change. Yes. And just like in any culture that you want to engineer, it might take time. Yes. Do you think that this, we have the time now to actually engineer uh, a, a more active kind of conversation instead of this passive learning, a little bit more active learning? Uh, do you think that we have the time or you know, we need to aggravate and, and perhaps you know, incentivize people to do more now so that we can make this speed along a little bit faster? Well, I, I this is where I think the debaters become a, a role model. You know, they are, they, are, they are into this, they know what to do. And the moment people see how these people perform and how they are quote unquote protected in that particular sense. I mean, some of the students are still skeptical. Do I say this? Will you, will you victimize me and stuff like that? We need to demonstrate they are open enough and as far as it is concerned. So these debating activities that we're having is basically a kind of a, a symbol or a metaphor to tell them, yes, you can speak. It doesn't really matter as long as you do it in the right way in, in, in the context of the academic. Yeah. And by, by the basic of it, Brian, is basically education is about building culture. Education is not, not just about employment and probability passing exam. Education is about building culture, building civilization. And I thought this is what Malaysia wants. You know, when you talk about the year 2020, we're supposed to be at this kind of a level that we are different from somebody else. Our culture is different. We are more refined. We have a lot more finesse. Uh, not the kind of way that we see today. The, 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 the You're not a talent factory. That's not what you no. are. No. And also the kind of uh, social media, the kind of uh, hyping between one another. I mean, this is something that is not... I would imagine in the year 2020, mm -hmm. we, have, we might not arrive at 2020, but at least our culture is more refined at this particular stage, which I don't see this at all. So this is where I thought education, quote unquote, uh, mind my language, has failed. Right. You know, we have, we have diverted education into something which is not supposed to be. And now this year is a year which I think is a very inflection year because UNESCO is starting to redefine what education is all about in the context of global warming, climate change and all these disparities that we have. Uh, you just listened to the first day of World Economic Forum today. It's the same issue that we need to settle. Mm. It's not about passing exams alone. I no. mean, that's important. It's economic mobility, it's climate change, it's gender inequality and so exactly. on. Exactly. And it's just not economics now. Mm. You know, you may be good in economics, but you need to balance with other things. This whole idea of trying to balance is about what debating is all about, I think. You know, critically uh, evaluating and giving a kind of a balanced opinion, uh, a considered opinion, rather than, you know, emotionally bursting out uh, just because you want to make a point. Mm. So this is a whole culture that I think we need to build in when we talk about education. And I think IIUM is there. 
Right. Still, there's a lot more to be done, I'm pretty <laughs> sure. Um, again, um, uh, IAUM uh, is celebrating its 35th anniversary. I don't know whether we can zoom in on this book. Um, there's plenty of activities currently happening there in the university. Um, of course, uh, the upcoming event, uh, the Arabic uh, competition, uh, debate competition is also taking place at the end of the month. Uh, do check that out. If you've missed any part of this interview, just head on to astroawen.com, look for Notepad. Uh, these kind of interviews can be found there. You can also watch this interview on your mobile devices. Just download the uh, Astro Uni app wherever you get your application and of course uh, this interview can also be listened to on podcasts again search for Astro Uni wherever you get your podcasts that's my conversation for this evening uh, with Tan Sri uh, Zulkifli Abdul Raza he is the director of IIUM until next time thanks very much for watching and goodbye mm.